Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and welcome to your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will cover all the topics on the ASCP lecture list. Today, we will be discussing methods for analyzing proteins. But first, have you ever wondered what high protein levels in your blood mean? It might sound alarming, but it's not always what you think. In this video, we'll explore the hidden meanings behind hyperproteinemia, from common causes like dehydration to more serious conditions. Stay tuned to uncover the facts that could impact your health. Your total protein levels, what do they mean? The protein checkup. A total protein test measures the overall amount of protein floating in your blood plasma. It's a broad indicator of your nutritional status, kidney health, liver function, and other potential issues. When levels are low, hypoproteinemia. Low total protein levels suggest a negative nitrogen balance, meaning your body's losing protein faster than it can make it. Several factors can contribute to this. Increased protein loss. Kidney disease, proteins leak into urine. Digestive issues, protein leaks from your gut. Bleeding, wounds, internal bleeding, or burns can cause protein loss. Decreased protein intake or absorption. Malnutrition, not enough protein in your diet. Intestinal malabsorption, problems absorbing nutrients from food. Reduced protein production. Liver disease, the main protein factory in your body is malfunctioning. Inherited immune disorders, antibody production is limited. Increased protein breakdown. Burns, trauma, or injuries can accelerate protein breakdown. What's next? Abnormal total protein levels require further testing to pinpoint the specific cause. Doctors will likely investigate which protein types, fractions, are out of balance for a more precise diagnosis. High protein levels in blood, what could it mean? High total protein levels don't necessarily indicate a disease itself, but rather a sign of an underlying issue. Dehydration. The most common cause is dehydration. When you lose fluids, water, the protein concentration in your blood goes up simply because there's less water to dilute it. This doesn't mean the total amount of protein actually increased. Other causes. Increased protein production, this can happen in some cases, particularly with the gamma globulin proteins involved in the immune response. Monoclonal proteins, paraproteins. These are abnormal proteins produced by abnormal cells in the bone marrow. Multiple myeloma is a common example, where these abnormal proteins can reach very high levels. Other conditions like Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia can also cause paraproteins. Chronic inflammatory diseases, long-lasting inflammation can also lead to increased protein levels. Polyclonal versus monoclonal increases. Pay attention to the types of protein chains involved, kappa and lambda. Polyclonal increase, both kappa and lambda chains are elevated, often seen in chronic illnesses. Monoclonal increase, primarily one type of chain, kappa or lambda, is high, suggesting a potential issue like multiple myeloma. Importance of further testing. If your total protein levels are high, more tests are needed to pinpoint the cause. This might involve looking at specific protein types and their proportions for a more precise diagnosis. Methods for analyzing proteins. Shedding light on nitrogen levels, how the total nitrogen test works. What is total nitrogen? It's a measurement of all the nitrogen contained within protein and other nitrogenous compounds in a sample, blood plasma or urine in this case. Why is it important? It helps assess your body's nitrogen balance which reflects how well you're using protein. Who might need this test? People on long-term intravenous feeding, total parenteral nutrition, are often monitored with this test to ensure they're getting enough nitrogen for protein synthesis. How is it measured? A fancy technique called chemiluminescence is used. Here's a breakdown. 1. The sample is heated to a very high temperature. 2. Any nitrogen in the sample gets converted to nitric oxide, NO. 
3. NO reacts with ozone, O3, to form an excited nitrogen dioxide molecule, NO2. 4. As NO2 returns to its normal state, it releases light. 5. The amount of light detected is proportional to the amount of nitrogen present. Basically, the more nitrogen, the brighter the light. Measuring total protein in blood, why it's a balancing act. What is total protein? It's the total amount of protein floating around in your blood plasma or serum. Normally, plasma has slightly more protein, 6.5 to 8.5 grams per deciliter, compared to serum, about 4% less. Challenges of measuring total protein. Blood contains many different types of proteins, each with unique properties, like charge and size. Many protein measurement methods react differently to different proteins, making it tricky to get an accurate total. In some cases, like kidney failure, small protein fragments can build up, further affecting the accuracy of certain methods. Common methods for measuring total protein. Several techniques are used, each with its own advantages and limitations. The Kjeldal method, a historical heavyweight, of protein measurement. What is it? The Kjeldal method is an older technique for measuring total protein. It's not commonly used in modern labs anymore, but it played a significant historical role. How does it work? 1. Protein breakdown. The sample is heated with sulfuric acid to break down protein into ammonium ions. 2. Ammonium detection. These ammonium ions are then converted to a measurable form. 3. Protein estimation. Based on the amount of detected nitrogen, assuming protein is 16% nitrogen, the total protein content is estimated. Why isn't it used much anymore? Time-consuming, the process is lengthy and not ideal for routine testing in busy labs. Inaccuracy for atypical proteins, if a protein has an unusual structure or different nitrogen content, the measurement can be inaccurate. Non-protein interference, other nitrogen-containing molecules, urea, amino acids, can affect the results, requiring additional steps to remove them. Why is it still important? Historical significance, the Kjeldal method paved the way for more modern protein measurement techniques. Reference standard, it's sometimes used as a reference point for calibrating other protein measurement methods like the Biuret method. He Biuret method, a colorful way to measure protein, with a few quirks. How it works, the colorful side. Imagine proteins like beads on a string. The biuret method uses a copper solution, Cu2+, that reacts with the bonds between these beads, peptide bonds, under strong alkaline conditions. This reaction creates a colorful complex, shifting the copper solution from blue to violet. Scientists measure the intensity of this violet color at a specific wavelength, 540 nanometers, to estimate the amount of protein present. Potential interfering substances, the quirky side. While it's a good method, some other molecules with similar structures can also bind to copper and affect the color measurement. Examples include, amino acids, certain buffers, and small protein fragments. Not all proteins react equally with copper. Proteins rich in the amino acid proline or with unusual structures might show weaker color changes. Important points. Despite these quirks, for most proteins, the biuret method provides a reliable estimate of total protein content, especially if the endpoint method, measuring final color intensity, is used. There are also rate-based variations of the biuret method, but they're considered separate techniques. Light absorption methods. Scientists can use light to estimate protein concentration in a sample. There are two main approaches. Ultraviolet, UV, light absorption. Proteins absorb UV light, especially at wavelengths between 270 to 290 nanometers. This method works best for purified proteins with known composition, especially tryptophan and tyrosine content. In complex mixtures, like blood plasma, Accuracy suffers because other molecules, amino acids, uric acid, also absorb UV light, making it hard to isolate the protein signal. At even shorter wavelengths, 
200 to 225 nanometers, peptide bonds themselves absorb UV light strongly, but this method is also prone to interference from other small molecules. Limitations and Alternatives For accurate protein measurement using UV light, removing smaller molecules from the sample might be necessary. Other techniques like infrared or Raman spectroscopy also analyze light interaction with the sample for protein determination, but these involve complex spectral analysis. Unveiling protein, the powerful, but not perfect, Lowry method. Supersensitive protein detection. The Lowry method is a protein measurement technique known for its impressive sensitivity, about 100 times better than the Biuret method. How it works. 1. The sample is mixed with a copper solution under alkaline conditions. 2. A special reagent, folinsiocal 2, is then added. 3. This combination reacts with protein and specific amino acids, tyrosine and tryptophan, to produce a blue-colored complex. 4. Scientists measure the intensity of this blue color to estimate the amount of protein present. Important Considerations Not all proteins react equally. Those rich in tyrosine and tryptophan will be detected more readily. Similar to other methods, small molecules like free amino acids and certain medications can interfere with the measurement, requiring their removal for accurate results in some cases. Checking protein levels, the quick, but limited, refractometry method. Fast and easy, for high protein. Refractometry offers a rapid way to estimate protein concentration, especially when protein levels are high. The catch, accuracy matters. As protein levels get lower, below 3.5 grams per deciliter, this method becomes less accurate. Other things like salts and glucose in the sample can also affect the measurement, making it unreliable for very dilute solutions. More common use. While it can be used for protein, refractometry is more commonly used in clinics to assess the overall concentration of dissolved substances, solutes, in urine samples, rather than specifically measuring protein. Shining a light on protein, scattering techniques. Protein makes light dance. These methods use light to measure protein, but in a different way than light absorption methods. They rely on the fact that protein particles scatter light when a beam is shown on them. Making protein clump, for better measurement. Special chemicals, reagents, are added to the sample to clump the proteins together. These protein clumps scatter light more effectively than individual protein molecules. Challenges and considerations. Different types of proteins, albumin versus globulins, can react differently with these reagents, affecting accuracy. Choosing the right reagent is crucial for reliable protein estimation. Conditions affecting protein concentration Hemoconcentration, increased concentration Dehydration, inadequate water intake or excessive loss Standing for a long time, reduced blood volume. Issues like Addison's disease or diabetic ketoacidosis. Hemodilution, decreased concentration. Overhydration, drinking too much water. Salt retention syndromes. Receiving large volumes of four fluids. Lying down, redistributes fluid, lowering measured protein. Don't keep all this valuable information to yourself. Share it with your friends who might find it interesting and beneficial. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. We love hearing from our viewers and we will do our best to answer all your questions. And finally, don't forget to ask for our ASCP short notes to supplement your studying. These notes are a great resource to help you review and retain the information we cover in our videos.